Good, good morning, Facebook world. So I'm reading The Sacred Romance by John Eldridge and Brent Curtis. Yesterday, I had some trouble with my dogs barking and being able to read because my reading glasses weren't strong enough. Yay. So today, um, picking up where I left off, what we were talking about yesterday was the, the arrows that pierce our heart and begin to kind of anesthetize us against um, the feelings of our heart and um, uh, our relationship with God. And these arrows come from the enemy and they're lies that he tells us and lies that we buy. And so where I'm picking up, he's talking about, um, he had just said that <clears throat> these arrows taint and partially direct even our spiritual life. And that's where I left off. So my own spiritual journey with Christ began. I've since come to know that beginning was long before I was born. When my first prayer to God since I was a boy escaped from my heart one morning at work. It was the morning after another night of searching for something or someone, searching in bars, nightclubs, and just driving around roads listening to music with all the help of enough alcohol and drugs to keep the search hopeful. I was working, installing pipe in the bottom of sewer wells. Um, I and the men I worked with lived with a cynicism that did for us in the daylight hours what the alcohol and drugs did at night. We wryly commented to each other, standing in sewage up to our chests at four in the morning, that we were as far down in life as we could get. <clears throat> there was no way to go but up. One morning, almost without bidding, my heart cried from its own depths, God help me because I am lost. And God answered with the lavish faithfulness in those first love years. I began reading the Bible, and it came alive in my hands and heart. A friend I knew from high school came by and told me that he had become a Christian. He invited me to attend classes with him at Philadelphia College of the Bible, where I drank in everything I was taught with hungry joy and anticipation. At night, Ralph and I would go listen to a speaker or simply hang out at a diner talking about God, life, girls, and the abundant living we were sure was ahead. That fall... I went to a retreat in the mountains of Pennsylvania and met a long-haired girl whose heart God had recently courted and won. We sat for hours talking about our personal longings and fears. We even prayed out loud together, a totally new concept for me. Becoming a Christian, however, doesn't necessarily solve the dilemmas of the arrows, as I was soon to realize. Mine were lodged deep and refused to allow some angry wound inside to heal. My resulting ambivalence colored every thought, action, and relationship of those important years. One day, at my by then fiancé's request, I sat for five hours on the shore of the lake trying to understand the doubts I had about getting married. I knew no more at the end of the day than I did at the beginning. I had no one at that point in my life to help me understand the ambivalence created by the message of the arrows. No one who could fit the contradictory messages of the two revelations, the romance and the arrows, into any kind of story that would allow for life's unknowns, even as my heart stayed open to the intimacy of the romance. So I, began my own, I became my own author and killed the one to control the other. I broke my engagement. I gave up the mystery of the romance for a story that was much more predictable, which is to say, aloneness. I allowed the romance to revive with another girl, Ginny, who eventually became my wife when I was 28, but the arrows refused to be silent, and I lived my late 20s and early 30s in a continuing blind reaction to the two revelations that vied for my soul. An old and familiar feeling began to make itself known from somewhere in the vicinity of my heart, a loneliness, an emptiness, a kind of ache and longing for something and someone I couldn't quite define. Feeling agitated and betrayed by such adulterous feelings, I pushed them down and threw myself even more intensely into Christian involvement and service. I began teaching our church's college and career class, became a singles pastor, and worked with our high school kids. Ginny and I were both teachers and used our summers to go to the mission fields in Mexico and the Dominican Republic as summer assistants with Wycliffe Bible Translators and Teen Missions. 
I even attended those strange Christian phenomena known as potluck suppers in church activity halls. These were all good things, but there was a part of me that refused to be healed or filled or freed or whatever it was my heart refused to be silent about. And since I never bothered to ask myself many questions, at least not the right questions, about what I felt or believed, I lived those years in a tangled web of fantasy, divorced from present living and reality, motivated by agnosticism and resignation. I lived in reaction to a series of happenings and circumstances that I felt unable to understand or even use as a way of understanding. I lived in the place where Forrest Gump found himself as he stood at the grave of his lifelong love, Jenny. I don't know if we have a destiny or if we're all just floating around accident-like on the breeze. Many of you are reading my many of you reading my story can relate to an inner journey that feels like my something like my own even though the scenes of a your outer story may be different. The sense of being part of some bigger story, a purposeful adventure that is a Christian life begins to drain away after those first love years in spite of everything we can do to stop it. Instead of a love affair with God, your life begins to feel more like a series of repetitive behaviors, like reading the same chapter of a book or writing the same novel over and over. The orthodoxy we try to live out, defined as believe and behave accordingly, is not a sufficient storyline to satisfy whatever turmoil and longing our heart is trying to tell us about. Somehow our head and heart are on separate journeys and neither feels like life. Eventually this division of head and heart culminates in one of two directions. We can either deaden our heart or divide our life into two parts where our outer story becomes the theater of the should and our inner story the theater of needs, the place where we quench the thirst of our heart with whatever water is available. I chose the second route, living what I thought of as my religious life with increasing dryness and cynicism while I found water where I could, in sexual fantasies, alcohol, the next dinner out, late night violence videos, gaining more knowledge through religious seminars, whatever would slake my thirsty restlessness inside. Whichever path we choose, heart deadness or heart and head separation, the arrows win and we lose heart. This is the story of all our lives in one way or another. The haunting of the romance and the message of the arrows are so radically different and they seem so mutually exclusive that they split our hearts in two. In every way, the romance is full of beauty and wonder. The arrows are equally powerful in their ugliness and devastation. The romance seems to promise a life of wholeness through deep connection with the great heart of the universe. The arrows deny it, telling us, you're on your own. There is no romance, no one strong and kind who is calling you to exotic adventure. The romance says, this world is a benevolent place. The arrows mock such naivete, warning us, just watch yourself, disaster is a moment away. The romance invites us to trust. The arrows intimidate us into self-reliance. It is as if we have been set up for a loss of the heart. I think about two couples who chose to go through marriage counseling with me, not because their relationships were terrible, but because both couples desired to live before God and each other with more freedom and love. Hannah and Mike, not their real names, were in their early 20s and had been married just a few months. Hannah had a difficult life before her marriage, moving from town to town with no relationship with her real father. Mike was a loner before he met Hannah, nursing the wounds from his own arrows in solitude. Hannah and Mike both loved the outdoors, and as their love for each other grew, they looked forward to a long life in the mountains with their yet-to-be-born children. One year after their marriage, I spoke to Hannah's memorial. I spoke at Hannah's memorial service in the Garden of the Gods. Cancer took her life almost before she had a chance to fight it. Sam and Leslie, not their real names, came for counseling after long years of fruitful service for God on the mission field. 
They were still young, in their early 50s, and they knew that they there were some unhealed things between them that would prevent them from having the deeper intimacy they both longed for in the years ahead. They entered into looking at their marriage with courage and hope at the same time at a life when it would have been easier just to stay with the status quo. They looked forward to enjoying the time to come with their children and grandchildren, as well as a deeper intimacy with each other. Not long ago, I stood at Leslie's graveside as Sam and the children said goodbye to her, Leslie also having been struck down by cancer. What are Mike and Sam left to conclude? Mike opened his heart only to lose everything in exactly the way he feared. Sam hoped to live out his years with Leslie enjoying his family and the fruits of his service, only to face the years ahead alone. The arrows strike at the most vital places in our hearts, the things we care the most about. The deepest questions we ever ask are directly related to our heart's greatest needs, and the answer life gives us shape our images of ourselves, our life, and of God. Who am I? The romance whispers that we are someone special, that our heart is good because it is made for someone good. And the arrows tell us that we are a dime store, uh, that we are a dime a dozen, worthless, even dark, twisted, dirty. Where is life to be found? The romance tells us life will flourish when we give it away in love and heroic sacrifice. The arrows tell us that we must arrange for what little life there may be, manipulating our world and all, and all the while watching our backs. God is good, the romance tells us. You can release the well-being of your heart to him. The arrows strike back. Don't ever let life out of your control. And they seem to impale with such authority, unlike the gentle urges of the romance, that in the end we are driven to find some way to contain them. The only way seems to be to kill our longing for the romance, much in the same way we harden our heart to someone who hurts us. If I don't want so much, we believe, I won't be so vulnerable. Instead of dealing with the arrows, we silence the longing. That seems to be our only hope. And so we lose heart. Which is the truer message? If we try to hang on to the romance, what are we to do with our wounds and the awful tragedies of life? How can we keep our heart alive in the face of such deadly arrows? Is it possible for Mike to risk opening his heart to love again? Can Sam ever totally trust the God he served for so long? How many losses can a heart take? If we deny the wounds or try to minimize them, we deny a part of our heart and end up living a shallow optimism that frequently becomes a demand for the world to be better than it is. On the other hand, if we embrace the arrows as the final word on life, we despair, which is another way to say lose heart. To lose hope has the same effect on our heart as it would be to stop breathing. If only there was someone to help us reconcile our deepest longings with our greatest fears. In my 30s, I didn't know that the one who answered the religious prayer of my mid-20s, God help me because I'm lost, was the same one who wooed me so long ago in the magic of the singers and even the harsh coldness of the November day. If I had known the years of my religious religiosity would have been filled with much more joy and confusion, mourning and hope, patience and spontaneity, and conviction and uncareful love than they have been. I would have lived with the confidence that the arrows aren't the final word, but I had lost my own story with the loss of my family as a boy, and along with it, any sense of the larger story that would reconcile the two messages of my, the two messages that my heart had known. Man, I would have thought I was a better reader than that. All right, uh, we'll read chapter four tomorrow. The, my story is big enough, a story big enough to live in. All right, have a good day.